talking about uh, uh, the the work we've done in in over the past few years in um, that's now being on the verge of being released in in the new version FreeBSD 7.0. So I will uh, 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 talk a bit about um, some of the uh, the major features uh, that will be making their appearance in in this new version. And the main uh, the main new feature is to do with multi-processor support. Um, so I'll spend a lot of time going over uh, what progress we've made over the past seven years, which is, this has been a major um, project, but we've now, we've now finished it. Uh, and then also some of the other features that, that will be making their, their appearance in FreeBSD 7. And um, I'll conclude with uh, uh, what I think is uh, going to be happening in the future. So uh, FreeBSD 7 uh, will be released uh, later in the year. Um, we're currently targeting uh, the middle of December. Uh, you can already download the, the, the beta release. Uh, the latest beta, I think, is, is uh, beta 3, which is coming out this week. Um, and uh, it's been about two years in development. So um, we've been working for quite a long time on this. And we think uh, that it's going to, to have a major impact. Um, I hope uh, I'll convince you of this um, uh, in my talk that, that really FreeBSD 7 is bringing some major changes to the BSD and open source um, operating system landscape. So uh, in, in the first part, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about um, the progress we've made in, in the SMP um, support for multiprocessor machines. And this has been really uh, the culmination of, of seven years of, of work by, by many people. Um, so I've got, a, got here a quote from, a mailing, from the mailing list um, in, in June 2000. Uh, which says, last week approximately 20 BSD developers got together and discussed how to move FreeBSD's SMP support to the next level. Our effort will be laced, budget, largely based on the work being done in BSDOS, which should make things go much more smoothly than they otherwise might, but we still expect current to be destabilised for an extended period of time. So this was quite prophetic, uh, and this was really um, uh, a lot more work than we thought it was, I guess, but, um, but nevertheless, uh, we've actually managed to, to achieve it. So in, in order to, uh, to explain about uh, uh, the improvements in multiprocessor support in, um, in uh, recent versions of FreeBSD, um, it's useful to first uh, uh, contrast to how, how it used to be in FreeBSD 4. So FreeBSD 4 and older versions of, of FreeBSD uh, is fundamentally a single-threaded kernel, and there's very limited support for, for multiple CPUs. Uh, so it, it is possible to, uh, uh, to run, if you have multiple CPUs, uh, running user code, um, so things running in user land, like say a, a compile process or something that's doing a lot of um, just numeric computation or, or whatever. Um, user code can run in multiple processes, but only one process at a time can execute in the kernel. Um, this means if, if you have two processes, they both want to, say, uh, one wants to write to a, to a socket, one wants to read from a disk, even though these are independent tasks that do not involve the same, uh, the same hardware resources, uh, the FreeBSD 4 kernel does not allow this to happen, and so one of them will have to block until the other one completes. Uh, the terminology we use for this is that there is a giant lock around the entire kernel, and so a process wanting to ex ex execute in the kernel must first... Um, uh, acquire this giant lock, and only then, once it has this, is it able to ex execute in the kernel. Um, there was limited parallelism in the kernel from device interrupts that, that, that could, um, depending on the situation, be processed in parallel, so on multiple CPUs, but there's some constraints there. And really, this isn't uh, a, a big source of parallelism unless you have um, certain workloads. So this, this historical architecture for the kernel um, works very well for single processor systems. It's, it's, it's quite, quite uh, well tuned for systems with only a single CPU, but it fundamentally doesn't scale to multiple, multiple, multiple CPUs. And as we know, uh, these are now universal. It's actually becoming quite hard to go out and buy a new, say, Intel system that doesn't have um, at least a dual core uh, CPU. So really, this, this uh, became increasingly important over time, and so it became clear, it was clear back in, in uh, uh, the late 90s and, and uh, early 2000s that, that we're, we, we had to focus on this. Okay, 
is this any better? Yeah. Right, good. Okay, so, so the goal uh, that we set ourselves was to redesign the FreeBSD kernel uh, as a multi-threaded system. Um, and for next generation SMP support, next generation is the NG in this SMP NG project. Uh, and the goal is that multiple CPUs must be able to execute kernel code in parallel. Obviously, there will be some constraints here because there are still shared resources that need to be, be managed. But uh, to, the, to, to the maximum extent possible, multiple CPUs should be able to, to, to work in parallel. So this requires serialization of, of shared data structures and, and shared resources. And we, we do this using various locking primitives, um, basically in, in standard, using standard techniques. Uh, and, and a key, uh, a key um, constraint is that we need to balance the performance needs of Uniprocessor systems as well as SMP systems. So we don't want to improve SMP performance at the expense of uh, uniprocessor performance. But the thing we found is actually these are not always different. Uh, and things that improve SMP performance often also improve uniprocessor performance. So this was an interesting um, thing we discovered. But nevertheless, this was a major uh, challenge. We, we basically had to redesign the entire kernel. Every part of the kernel was touched. Uh, so this was a huge effort. Uh, but uh, we've, now, uh, we've now completed this. So uh, one can outline the, the, the three stages of uh, development that occurred um, in SMP and G. Uh, and in a sense, you might call this a universal development model in which any um, uh, kind of software development project could be, um, uh, could be uh, done in this form. So the first step is to make, uh, make your changes work. So, um, the first goal is you have an idea you want to, uh, uh, to implement. Um, the first step is just to get it working. And this was really what the FreeBSD 5 branch was about. Uh, so FreeBSD 5, the early releases, which um, uh, came out in 2003, 2004, were the debut of this new architectural model for multiprocess support in FreeBSD. And then over the course of the remaining releases on the branch, 5.3, 5.4, which came out over the next two years. Um, this was really, uh, by this, this point, most of the fundamental changes were in place. Um, and there was some initial progress with um, improving the kernel parallelism in, in 5.3 and 5.4. For example, um, the network stack and virtual memory systems were, um, uh, had been parallelized uh, in those releases. But at, that, at this stage, our goal was not to uh, worry about performance, um, and actually performance was not very good as, as you'll see in my, in my graphs. The goal at this stage was just get it working, and then later on um, you worry about the rest, which is the second step, which is once, you, once the, the code works, then make it work well. <laughs> and previously six was this process of taking the, the working code and then just fixing problems, um, working on stabilizing the code, uh, and um, uh, also starting to look at performance, but um, this was really, you know, it's the second stage in the process. You don't want to, before um, your code is working, you, you shouldn't be focusing on optimization. Uh, FreeBSD 6 came out in 2005, and then there have been two subsequent releases um, uh, until this year. FreeBSD 6.3 is uh, also due out um, probably by the end of the year, uh, although FreeBSD 6 is now kind of um, reaching its end of life. And this, this branch was mostly about stabilizing the work we'd done in FreeBSD 5. Uh, there was uh, stabilizing and completing. Uh, so there was some performance benefits from development work that occurred after the branch of FreeBSD 5. Uh, and the main uh, of this was that virtual file system and Unix file system um, code is now uh, parallel. This means that file system performance is, is much better. Uh, and by FreeBSD 6.0, um, we would largely uh, succeeded in, in the initial goals that large parts of the kernel may now operate in parallel and you start to see significant performance gains on uh, a lot of common workloads. And the third and, and perhaps final step in this process is really to focus exclusively on optimization. So FreeBSD 7 is, is, um, has been largely about really focusing on benchmarking uh, and uh, tuning the, the uh, locking strategies and um, really uh, focusing on, on performance. Uh, so with FreeBSD 7, uh, one can say um, quite conclusively that the goals that we set ourselves for the SMP and G project have been achieved. 
the FreeBSD 7 kernel is fully, fully parallel, um, and the giant lock uh, is no longer present on almost all possible workloads. It still exists in, 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 the, in the code, but the, the circumstances under which the giant lock is acquired are quite rare, um, unless you happen to, uh, uh, to choose a bad workload that happens to, to, to hit this. But for, for um, uh, the vast majority of things that you're doing, um, the giant lock is just never actually an issue. It's, it's actually quite rare for it even to be acquired at all. So FreeBSD 7 has been a shift of focus from correctness to optimization, and uh, the results have been uh, quite impressive. Uh, to illustrate this, I will um, show you some, some graphs uh, from a particular database benchmark, um, which illustrates them quite well. This is a, um, an online transaction processing benchmark, which is available in the ports, tre uh, ports tree. Uh, it does um, various uh, transactions uh, to the database. Uh, I'm showing you graphs uh, operating in read-only mode, so the database is only being read, not written to. And the main reason for this is that uh, once you start introducing write I.O., then you start to benchmark your disk. And so it's hard to see where the, like, what parts of the performance are coming from the kernel and what is just your hardware. Uh, and uh, some details about the configuration. I, I'm uh, comparing both PostgreSQL and uh, MySQL. These are uh, different in, in the way that they're, they're designed. Uh, MySQL uses threads for the database. Um, and uh, so this is going to, uh, to exercise the thread system, whereas PostgreSQL uses processes and they communicate by System 5 IPC. So these are actually quite different in the way they're implemented. And so you do get good coverage of, of various kernel systems here. Uh, and then I, I uh, compared on, uh, I measured on two uh, eight core systems. Um, one of them is running in, in AMD 64 mode, 64 bit mode. The other is running in 32 bit mode. Uh, and um, the specs are more or less the same. Uh, this one is about 10-15% um, faster. Okay, so this is uh, a graph of the performance of PostgreSQL on uh, the three sort of um, uh, most recent um, releases on each of these branches. So let me uh, take you through uh, what we see here. So the first one to look at is from SD 5.5, and that is this, this curve down the bottom here. So really, there is very little to be excited about in, in, in the FreeBSD 5 performance. Um, there is a very small amount of, of improvements. Uh, at, so this is showing the number of, of um, concurrent database queries that are being made by various clients. Uh, and then this is the, basically the performance of the, of the database. Transactions per second, so higher is better. Um, so there is, uh, with a second um, client, there is some improvement in performance, but beyond two clients, performance drops, and then we hit this, um, this tail here. So really, there's very little performance improvement from a second CPU here. Previously 6.2, we start to see some, uh, some scaling, and so up to about six clients, we're actually getting uh, an improved performance. But then again, after six, uh, six clients, performance drops off and then approaches the same, um, the same quite low performance at high, at high loads. And it's actually even lower than the, the single um, client performance. Uh, but now we look at what happens in previously seven, and here there are two graphs because we have a choice of scheduler. Um, and the 4BSD scheduler is the same as, as, as is used in these older releases. This is sort of a, the historical BSD scheduler, and that's this blue curve. So you can see that performance is quite uh, dramatically improved, but nevertheless, um, compared to the, the new scheduler um, available in 7, ULE, um, it's still quite, uh, quite lacking. But uh, this, uh, the new ULE scheduler is really performing very well. Um, we scale uh, from running a single client, database client, all the way up to eight clients um, here, which is the number of CPUs, we scale linearly, which is the ideal case. Um, every new client that you add gives you the same extra amount of performance. So really, you're not losing any performance by adding um, uh, concurrent uh, work to the system. And once we reach our peak, then performance does not change, even as we add um, many more uh, clients to the system. So this is really quite ideal performance. We have linear scaling up to 
um, the CPU capacity, and then we have a, a flat performance tail, meaning we don't, uh, we don't lose performance as load increases beyond peak. So this is, is really, we we're very happy to see the, these kinds of curves. Um, so, uh, in order to, to achieve to, to achieve this, you know, this is this needs the uh, the new scheduler um, for uh, kind of conservative release engineering reasons. Uh, the four BSD scheduler is 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 going to be the, the default scheduler in seven point zero as it's released. Um, we're likely to change this for the next release, but uh, you can easily switch to ULE um, just by recompiling your kernel. Uh, and so I recommend that you you do this because really there are quite significant performance benefits to be, to be, to be had by, by using this. Uh, as as I, I mentioned, it's, it's really allowing ideal performance from the hardware on this bench, uh, benchmark. And if you, if you profile in detail what the kernel is doing, you find that in FreeBSD 7, there are no more remaining performance problems in the kernel on this workload. So really, we've, we've gone as far as we can on this, on this benchmark, and uh, we've sort of run out of things to fix, which is uh, always a nice situation to be in. Uh, so what, uh, what I show here now is how does the performance change as I vary the number of CPUs on the same hardware. So what I'm doing is taking my 8-core uh, Opteron and I'm disabling um, some number of CPUs. So I'm either leaving only one CPU running or two or four or eight. And so uh, this lets you uh, to see how performance of FreeBSD 7 varies on, on effectively one, two, four or eight CPU machines. And it's the same, uh, same benchmark as I just showed, but this is uh, with the new release schedulers. This is the uh, kind of you know, the best case one. So the first thing is to look at the performance on a single CPU system, and that's these two curves here are actually identical. Uh, it might be hard to see that the um, this purple one and this uh, light blue one are the same. Uh, which is the difference here is is whether I'm running a a, a kernel which is compiled with uh, with SMP support, even though there's only one CPU, or without S SMP support. Um, in principle, this SMP kernel has extra overhead from doing various logging operations that aren't done here. But what we see is that it actually doesn't matter. There is effectively no overhead from running an SMP kernel with the extra locking uh, enabled compared to Uniprocessor. This is this is uh, instructive because it tells us that the locking is not uh, it's not, we're not losing performance from, from doing these lock operations. It actually doesn't really matter, at least in this benchmark. And now if we compare with uh, adding a second CPU, uh, performance is about double uh, what you would get from a single CPU, which is, um, again, the best, the best case scenario. And we still have a flat behavior where we don't uh, lose performance at higher load. Uh, going to four CPUs, we again get a doubling in, in performance. Uh, and then again, going to eight CPUs, we also get um, uh, almost a doubling in performance. There is a slight, a slight uh, loss, and this, this is where the overhead is starting to kick in. But it's almost um, eight times the performance of, of the, uh, the, 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 the lowest case. Uh, and then again, we have the flat behavior. So. Um, okay, so these are the points I mentioned. Okay, moving now to looking at MySQL performance, again, comparing on the three versions. Uh, now, this, this graph is more complicated because there are, there are more, um, uh, more possibilities, but um, focusing first on, on FreeBSD 5.5, uh, there, there are a choice of, of two threading libraries. Uh, this, this first one, end to one, is uh, what is called lib libc underscore r, which is the, again, the historical um, uh, thread library, and this actually is, does not make any use of, of multiple CPUs. The n means the number of threads, and the one means the number of CPUs. So with this library, no matter how many threads you have, they all run on the same CPU. Um, and this is this is <laughs> this this is uh, appropriate if you only have a a new processor system where you don't have more than one CPU. But um, it's obvious. Yes. Okay, so maybe I'll try like this. Um, uh, okay, so um, well, 
if somebody knows what to do, maybe uh, come up and tell me. Um, uh, right, so this is the uh, basically the uniprocessor thread library, and that's the one here. And so as you would expect, if you're only using one CPU, you cannot possibly hope to get more than one CPU worth of work out of it. Uh, and at the same time, you shouldn't lose performance as you, um, as you add more load. And that's what you see here. It's basically flat across the board. But the, the point about this is that this is, is like a baseline, that if your multiprocessor um, workload cannot do better than this, this, uh, this baseline, then really you're not going in the right direction. Well, okay, then you haven't succeeded. Um, we see here we did go in the right direction, but at first, FreeBSD 5.5, this is the multi-threading library which tries to run um, multiplex, multiple threads on multiple CPUs. This is so-called libkse, uh, and that's this, this green curve. And you can see that it actually doesn't manage to break evil. It breaks even with, with uh, two clients, but then it, it ends up with, with basically zero performance. Um, so, so this was... Um, uh, the situation of FreeBSD 5.5. FreeBSD 6.2 introduced a new library which, which runs each thread on its own CPU. So it doesn't try and do this multiplexing that, that uh, libkse does. This actually is not the default library in 6.2. It still has this end-to-end. -end. So the default case of FreeBSD 6.2 is actually the same as this green curve. But there is this other option, which is libtkhr, uh, which is this curve in blue. And this actually does start to see some performance benefits. Um, that we do get again some scaling up to about five, uh, five clients and then again at higher load performance drops below the, the baseline. So some improvement but, but not uh, significant. But now again for EBC 7 where we put this, all this effort into, into fixing these problems uh, the 4BSD scheduler is here uh, this is the default scheduler and we have again a linear behaviour with a flat tail but there's a um, a big gap between 4BSD and ULE. So ULE is the uh, sort of the best, again, the best case scenario here. Um, ignore this, this blue curve. This is um, based on old data, which I wasn't able to, um, to remove yet. Um, so this brown curve is what, what you would get if you uh, go and install FreeBSD 7, uh, the latest beta, beta 3, and enable the ULE scheduler. Um, this is the performance curve you'll get. And so again, it's very similar in, in, in characteristics to the PostgreSQL curve, where we have a linear scaling up to eight CPUs, where we saturate our machine, and then um, some degradation of higher loads, but, but actually not so, not so much uh, performance loss um, at higher workloads. Uh, now this degradation, the reason why here it's not perfectly flat, is actually due to um, a MySQL um, uh, architectural issue uh, basically, there's at least one uh, pthread mutex which is being really heavily contended within MySQL, um, and we're able to do some work to actually re uh, uh, reduce the performance loss. But but basically, this is an architectural problem in, my, in MySQL. So um, you know, we do what we can to try and make the damage less less bad. But but really, MySQL is the thing that's not scaling very well above um, eight CPUs. And it's worthwhile noting that on this benchmark. Um, PostgreSQL is actually 35 to 45% faster than MySQL, and that's true at all loads. So um, this is interesting because uh, MySQL has a reputation of being uh, faster than PostgreSQL, and perhaps this was true historically, but uh, at least on this benchmark um, and using modern versions of, of both of these, um, PostgreSQL appears to be faster. So this, this may be an um, interesting thing to keep in mind if you're designing a database. So now uh, one can ask is, okay, so we, we seem to have to be doing pretty well against ourselves, but how do we go against uh, other operating systems? And um, so here I'm, I'm comparing, uh, again, PostgreSQL. This is now on the, um, in 32-bit mode. This is just because this is the, the hardware I could get Linux to run on, basically. Um, and so here is uh, the red curve is FreeBSD 7. And the closest competitor is, is this version of the Linux kernel, 2.6.22, which is somewhat slower than FreeBSD 7 and has a weird performance artifact at intermediate loads. Um, this is actually real. Um, if you run this repeatedly, this is actually, there's, there's no noise in, this, in this, this part. It does actually drop for some reason and then it comes back up. But uh, the point is that the best, uh, the best version of Linux is actually still about 15% slower than FreeBSD 7, or so the other way around, FreeBSD 7 is 15% faster than Linux. 
Uh, it's interesting that the, the most recent version of, of Linux, where they changed the scheduler, is actually performing a lot worse. So um, this is uh, this was a, a pre-release of 2.6.23, and this is Blue Curve, where it again has some very strange. Um, actually, this is probably due to lack of CPU affinity. We saw kind of the same feature in, in earlier versions of FreeBSD 7, um, but it has. Uh, really quite a, a big difference in, in performance. And this is actually quite comparable to the performance of the 4BSD scheduler. So um, they appear to, at least on this, uh, so here where it's kind of dropping at um, intermediate levels, they seem to have, have basically gone backwards in their, um, in their scheduler support. And perhaps they'll fix this in future versions, but at least uh, for now they're, they're really going in the wrong direction. Uh, uh, NetBSD, this is a development version of NetBSD with some experimental changes. This is kind of the best case scenario for NetBSD. Uh, and, and you can see that they are also on the path to improving their S&P performance, but um, they still have quite a bit of, 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 uh, of work to go. And uh, because uh, this often comes up in conversation, um, people ask me about how Dragonfly performs. That's this bottom curve here. And uh, really, there's not a lot of, going, of performance going on in Dragonfly. Um, this is uh, useful to, to know because um, uh, at least initially the, the goal of the Dragonfly project was to, to work on, on SMP performance, uh, but they actually haven't managed to achieve that. Uh, so again, uh, MySQL, um, it's the same comparison. FreeBSD 7 is the best performing, followed by Linux, which is uh, about 20% uh, uh, slower here. Uh, and again, the, the new version of the Linux scheduler is much worse than the older version, and then NetBSD and, Open, and, and Dragonfly are um, further behind. So the most interesting part of this is comparison to Linux. Um, so initially, in fact, when we, we first ran these performance benchmarks, this was with the 2.6.20.1 kernel, uh, and the situation was, was much worse. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the data, so I couldn't plot it. Um, but the, uh, the Linux kernel in its older version had a curve that came up like this and then dropped and then ended up, ended up down here. So this was, with really quite a recent kernel, this was actually only released in, in February. So many actually Linux distributions are still running these kinds of older, older kernels. Uh, so this was a big wake-up call for the Linux developers. And um, they have managed to make some improvements in the past six months since we first publicised our benchmarks. Um, but uh, as we see, they still have um, uh, some catching up to do. And the most interesting thing actually is their new scheduler, which, which they, they um, uh, added in, in 2.6.23. Um, this is this completely fair scheduler, which does appear to be completely fair to FreeBSD. Um, but they seem to have some work um, to do to actually um, repair the, the problems in this. And uh, NetBSD uh, is making progress. Okay, so, so that, that concludes my first part, um, overviewing uh, the, uh, the changes we've made in, in, in the uh, area of SMP support. And now I'd like to move on to uh, an overview of the new features that, that uh, will be appearing in, in FreeBSD 7. So this is clearly a very incomplete list because uh, the new version, as with all new versions, has updates to basically every part of the kernel, uh, every part of the operating system, in fact. And if you do a quick uh, code count, um, there's more than 18,000 individual changes that were committed between FreeBSD 6 uh, and the branching, of FreeBSD, the branching of FreeBSD 7 and the release. And so these are, uh, a lot of them are minor changes, but there are some, some major ones. So I've, I've broken these up into uh, six categories, um, and uh, we'll go through these in order. So firstly, looking at uh, changes to the file system and storage system ch um, systems. Uh, perhaps the most uh, exciting change is the uh, introduction of support for Sun's ZFS. Um, this is work done by Pavel, and uh, he's, he's worked very hard on this. And actually, this is really quite an amazing um, new file system. Um, it, it, it does change the way that you think about, about, about file systems and the way that you, you use them. And so really this is, um, if you haven't already looked at, at ZFS, um, I, I encourage you to do this. Um, it really is a very interesting um, piece of technology. Uh, and uh, so uh, 
basically FreeBSD is, is the only uh, open source system that, that, that has uh, good support for this. Uh, the Linux version is based on, on Fuse, which is, um, and it's, it seems to be quite deficient. Um, so uh, another major um, uh, change is that this UnionFS, um, which has been available in FreeBSD for uh, at least uh, a decade, uh, it was broken for a long time, but now it's usable. Uh, this, this allows you to overlay multiple file system hierarchies into a single image, so you can um, combine, say, um, if you have a jail and then you, you want to, to mount a ports tree, um, you can um, combine this into a single thing using UnionFS. Um, it's probably better examples, but this is quite useful. Uh, we now have read-only support for XFS, which uh, was a system, a file system developed by SGI, I think. Um, uh, support for Coda, which is a distributed file system, has been, been fixed. Again, this has been around for a long time, but it became uh, broken and now it's fixed. Uh, there are some performance improvements which are, are relevant, particularly if you use UFS quotas. Um, these uh, are now parallelized, so this means that um, enabling quota support on your UFS um, doesn't slow down the file system. And uh, the NFS client and server are both also uh, now uh, parallelized. So this gives uh, performance improvements, uh, and then there are some other uh, improvements we've made to the, to the file system support um, over NFS. Uh, at the storage layer, uh, the major change is at the SCSI layer, which is called CAM, uh, is now parallelized. And uh, many, although not, not all, drivers uh, are also running without the giant lock. So this gives you performance benefits uh, for SCSI device access, including um, file systems on SCSI. We now have, uh, in the base system, we have an iSCSI initiator. There's also a target uh, in, in the ports tree. iSCSI is a way of uh, exporting remotely um, a device, or I think more generally a file system or a file, over TCP IP and then mounting it on, on a remote system. So this is uh, quite interesting. Um, and we now have the ability to do this. Uh, FreeBSD, for a long time, has had, had a, uh, a pluggable storage layer called JOM, and this, this allows you to combine, more or less arbitrarily, various uh, modules that, um, that uh, operate at, at, on, on your data. Uh, and, and so the new JOM modules that appear in 7, um, again, uh, this, is, this one, G-Journal, is, is by Puggle, and this is a block-level journaling provider. So you can use this with UFS, for um, journaling support, uh, block level journaling support um, of UFS, which is a feature that um, has been, been missing and needed for a long time. Uh, we have uh, uh, a virtualized storage provider called GVirstore. This is basically lets you create a huge disk image. So say uh, you can create a disk image that appears to be say two terabytes, and then you populate this two terabyte image with some number of disks, maybe only providing 100 gigabytes or so of, of disk space, and then you can add more disks to this virtual disk later on, uh, and so you don't have to, to reorganize your, um, your storage layout. Uh, we have Gcache, which is a, a read cache for storage layers, um, which in certain, case, certain situations may improve performance access. Um, we have some, some multi-path support, which is uh, useful for fiber channel and so on, and we have some virtualized partition support uh, for things like uh, GPT, and this is Apple's partition uh, mechanism. Okay, so uh, moving on to the network stack. Uh, FreeBSD 7 uh, completely eliminates the giant lock from the network stack. Uh, previously, it, it was still around in some cases. For example, there were some protocols that required giant, and also some drivers that required giant, and so now we've eliminated those, um, that code, and uh, it runs completely without the giant lock. There's been a lot of ongoing work cleaning up and, uh, and um, developing uh, the network stack, particularly TCPIP. Uh, one aspect of this development work has been um, that socket buffers are now uh, dynamically sized. So this means that uh, they automatically respond to network conditions um, and um, to uh, your, for example, your, um, your bandwidth and um, bandwidth delay product and so on. And so this automatically um, size of the socket buffers, and this improves the throughput. So you, um, you basically you want to avoid um, the socket buffer being full when you can still transmit more data, and, and this, this tries to do this. 
There is a, uh, a new uh, protocol stack called SCTP, Stream Control Transition Protocol. This is being, um, uh, it's a standardized protocol that's being uh, developed by Cisco. And previously is the reference, oper the reference system for, uh, for SCTP. Um, it, previously, there were two versions of, of IPsec. Uh, one came from the Kame project, who um, these were the guys who, who developed the IPv6 stack used by BSD, uh, and they had their own IPsec implementation. Uh, previously, uh, added a, a, a new, um, some time ago, added a new uh, version of IPsec called Fast IPsec, uh, and this is now um, has replaced Kame. Uh, this is called Fast because it uh, is faster, um, and uh, it's uh, also allows to integrate with, um, if you have cryptographic accelerator hardware, um, this will be, be used by RPSEC. So instead of doing all of your, all of your cryptographic um, encoding and decoding in, uh, on your CPU, which means that you know, other things can't use the CPU, it gets offloaded to the hardware, and um, this is only possible with, with fast RPSEC. Uh, so this was, these are the two main reasons for, for doing this. And fast RPSEC now works with both IPv4 and v6. Previously, it was limited to version 4. Okay, so uh, some more technical changes um, to how network uh, traffic is, is, is dispatched. So we now have something called direct dispatch. Um, and this, this avoids context switching um, and gives uh, some improved um, uh, case locality and allows them for more concurrency in processing um, receiving of network traffic. So this, this uh, has been measured to give significant performance benefits for processing network traffic on many workloads. Um, and then some additional features that we have. One interesting one is uh, that there's a, uh, an optional um, just-in-time compiler for BPF programs. So um, things like TCP dump uh, use a system called BPF which is a way of matching packets in the kernel. It's actually a programming language where you, you instruct the kernel how to, uh, which packets you want. And this is done previously as an interpreted language, uh, but now there's this optional just-in-time compiler, which means that performance of things that are, that are using BPF for pa packet matching, like TCP dump, but also um, things like snort, um, uh, will now uh, work much faster. Though. They won't drop as many packets and so on. Um, this is quite interesting. Uh, we also have in kernel uh, NAT modules for the userland NATD, and this again allows you to process some of the work in the kernel as opposed to having to bounce it to userland and then bounce back. This also gives you improved throughput um, when you're doing um, uh, packet processing over using a network address translation. We have support for link, link aggregation, which allows you to uh, combine multiple physical interfaces into virtual interfaces and then use these for fault tolerance so if one fails you, you still have, um, have a channel and also for aggregating capacity so you can have higher bandwidth effectively by combining multiple lower bandwidth um, um, connections. And we also have now uh, support for rapid, the rapid spanning tree protocol which is used in bridging. Okay, the level of hardware support. Uh, we, we now have support for uh, most of the common uh, 10 gigabit Ethernet drivers. This is sort of the new, um, the new standard that's emerging uh, for, for, uh, for high-end high uh, uh, Ethernet. And so we support the Chelsea Intel Miracom and Ethereum um, hardware. So this is, is going to be, uh, become increasingly important over time. And uh, a feature that, that, that many newer uh, drivers support as a performance improvement is, is the ability to offload um, the send and receive of, of data from the CPU into the hardware. So this is called uh, transmit segmentation offload and large receive, off, receive offload. Uh, so we're able to, to push some of the work of, of processing packets, uh, both the transmit and receive, into the driver using the specialized hardware on the driver, again, as opposed to having to do it on, on the host CPU. And we have uh, a lot of new devices supported, which I'll, I'll cover um, throughout the talk. Uh, one area where, where we have, there's been a lot of work um, is in the wireless 802.11 right um, layer and I believe actually we'll be hearing a lot more about this tomorrow but um, uh, just to, to go over this, um, 
we have support for well various um, Atheros cards, uh, including the high power and the 900 megahertz Ath cards. Uh, these these uh, drivers, um, I'm told, are, are the highest quality, so we have the best support for, for, for this, this hardware. But we also have a, a support for a lot of newer uh, drivers as well, which, which work. Um, some of them uh, perhaps need some work, but um, uh, they're supported. Uh, this, this one is interesting. The, the Intel wireless driver, these are um, found in a lot of laptops, for example, um, and they basically work out of the box. Uh, I, I don't know specifically about, about the, the driver support here. Okay, so, so Brooke says it's, it's been committed um, to, to CVS last week, yeah. and, and uh, Philip says that it has problems on his laptop. So um, apparently we have some support for that, but it sounds like perhaps there is still work to be done. Okay, so, so support for Wi-Fi protected access is stable uh, in FreeBSD 7. Uh, we have some new uh, support for new scanning modes. We can do background scanning and roaming. Uh, there's support for uh, some Atheros protocol extensions and ADTurtle.11n, um, which is a forthcoming standard uh, with various performance uh, features. So the support for the protocol layer has been committed to, to, the, to FreeBSD 7, although uh, the drivers uh, are not yet in um, committed, but these will come later. Uh, so there's a lot of work preparing for, for future uh, future development, which will appear later on in the FreeBSD 7 branch. So probably FreeBSD 7.1 will include um, improvements in these areas. There's been a lot of work done um, porting FreeBSD to new architectures, or adding new ports of FreeBSD to, to architectures. Um, a lot of work done on supporting ARM. Um, this was present in, in FreeBSD 6, but this, it's been getting a lot of work. So we have uh, improved support for this part number. Um, we have now support um, these X scale boards. Um, and there are some improvements in, uh, in, in how um, other improvements relative to uh, uh, relevant for embedded devices. So a lot of companies are actually starting to use FreeBSD ARM in their own products. So this is actually getting um, uh, a lot of attention. Uh, we have some preliminary, uh, a preliminary port um, to Sun's new UltraSpark T1 architecture. This is a very interesting uh, new CPU architecture, which um, is basically hyperthreading on steroids. Um, you have uh, a single on a si single CPU. You have eight CPU cores. Each of these cores has four, four um, uh, CPU threads, um, and this gives you effectively. Uh, what appears to the to the to the system as 32 uh, logical CPUs per C per package. So uh, clearly, running a system on 32 CPUs is is quite a challenge. But then you also have problems, with, well, issues where um, these are are actually only hyper threads, and so you have to to be very careful about how you schedule things and so on. This is a, basically a very interesting architecture, uh, and uh, it's. One to keep an eye on. Um, for example, the the T2, which is the successor to T1, has 64 uh, CPUs per package. So this is this is going in, a, in an interesting new direction. Um, we have support for this, and that we run, but there are uh, stability problems that need to be need to be addressed. Uh, and then we can also we also now support running on your Xbox uh, if you wanted to. Um, okay, so. One area that's had a lot of work in FreeBSD over the past uh, five or so years is uh, in various advanced security systems. Um, this uh, came from, or, uh, was, it runs under, under the project of this Trusted B project. Um, this is uh, um, run by Robert Watson, also with the um, uh, involvement of many others. This was a, an effort to, to really uh, add some some uh, high-level security features to, to FreeBSD. Uh, the major change in FreeBSD 7 is that the audit subsystem um, is now enabled by default. So audit is a way of, um, in a very fine-grained and configurable way, uh, logging uh, the uh, events that might be relevant for security. For example, uh, keeping track of what system calls are, are, are made by a process and various um, application and user space activities. And 
uh, this is done in such a way that uh, uh, you can keep an eye on um, or, or, or watch out for uh, for possible um, uh, uh, unexpected behavior of, of your application, or at least um, have, you have a record once, once something goes wrong of what actually happened, and you can reconstruct um, the chain of events. So the audit code was developed for Mac OS X, uh, and then it was ported from Mac OS X to FreeBSD. So this is a nice example of, of how code um, uh, doesn't just migrate in this direction, but also can come the other way. Um, and uh, so there have been some, ch some changes uh, internally to the APIs used by the kernel for managing privileges. Um, it's Prov9 API, which is a way of, um, of um, encapsulating all of the, the various uh, privileges you might want um, to, to modify, for example, the privilege to write a file or to read a file. Um, and uh, this can actually be modified by, um, by pluggable modules. So if you wanted to replace the Unix permission model, for example, you can do that. So leaving the kernel now, looking at userland, uh, there have been many uh, updates to system applications. So for example, new versions of less, new versions of bind, um, various applications that we include that are developed by third parties uh, have been updated. So um, basically too many to list here. Uh, one interesting feature that, that has been added to... Was there a question? Sorry. Um, uh, one new feature is that uh, we have a way of caching queries to, to the name service switch. This basically means uh, if you do repeated um, lookups of, of, of a user ID or a group ID or a, a host, a host name, this goes via NS switch and you can cache these queries so that repeated queries don't actually, uh, for example, if, if this is being query, querying over uh, NIS or um, say open LDAP or something which um, you can use within switch, in a switch, these can be cached so that you don't actually um, repeat the query and this can give you uh, a lot of benefit. Uh, the ports collection is, is one of the um, uh, important features of FreeBSD. Uh, currently, actually this was about a month ago, but uh, we have uh, nearly 18,000 um, third party applications that are uh, available in ports and uh, compared to the, the size at the time of release of 6.2, we've added about 1,800 um, new applications. Of course, way too many changes to list, but the major changes since the release of 6.2, uh, we have, uh, we, we now use uh, version 7.3 of, of the X um, Windows system from Xorg, and um, a lot of improvements here, um, including some nice eye candy um, from working composite support, but, but really this is um, huge ch a huge change. Uh, and then we have the current versions of both KDE and, and GNOME, uh, and then uh, about 24,000 other changes to, to the ports collection, so, so really a lot of work going on here. Uh, this, is, this is a slide just showing how, how the, the ports collection has grown over time. Uh, this is uh, the date, so uh, starting in 1995, and here we are today. Uh, so there was a period of, of exponential growth over the, the first five years or so, but then over the past seven years, we've maintained very consistently a linear growth in the size of the ports collection. Um, so uh, this is um, uh, interesting because as the size of the ports collection grows, uh, its, its complexity also grows. The amount of work required to, to keep it running, let alone... Um, uh, to add new ports is, is growing constantly, uh, but this shows we've actually managed to keep up with the uh, keep up with the pace. So performance, I of course covered in, in great detail, um, and really there've been performance imp improvements throughout the system. Uh, I'll just emphasise again that uh, we have a new scheduler, the ULE scheduler, um, which I recommend uh, instead of the historical scheduler. Um, it's not just relevant for multiprocessor systems. It also has a lot better interactive performance on desktops, so really there's no reason not to use ULE. Um, and if you find a problem with it, um, we want to fix it. So for obviously we'll remain the default in 7.0. Um, this is uh, mostly just to be conservative because of possibility of, of, of problems with ULE in some configurations. Um, but then uh, the intention is to switch to ULE in, in 7.1.
And of course, you can make the change whenever you like just by recompiling your kernel. Uh, and the message here is that, is that uh, if you can find a workload that, that Fremd 7 performs badly on, we want to hear about it because we want to fix it. Um, and so we've been focusing on the workloads that we have identified as being a challenge. Um, and uh, there are some things that, w that we uh, are planning to work on in into the future. But um, of course, it's hard to, to think of every possible workload that, that you might want to run on FreeBSD. And so if you, if you test this, and you find something that doesn't work well, um, I want to know about it. OK, so a summary of, of some other changes in the kernel. Um, we have some partial support for emulation of the Linux 2.6 kernel. Um, previously, uh, well, currently still, the, the default is to emulate the 2.4 kernel. And 2.6 includes various new system calls we need to add emulation for. So this is only partial, and it's not enabled by default yet. But um, this will improve over time. We have support for uh, MSI and MSIX, which uh, is an interrupt um, signaling mechanism, which is used by or can be used by um, high-end PCI devices, uh, and this gives you improved performance um, on those devices. And at some point, it will probably become mandatory. Um, so uh, we also support um, the Intelligent Platform Management Interface, which is a way of monitoring system hardware. Um, We've improved support for so-called legacy free hardware, for example, um, uh, newer um, Mac uh, laptops um, remove some of the, the legacy mechanisms that, that have been inherited from PCs for a lot of time, and so we've improved uh, support for this. Uh, we uh, can now boot over Firewire. Um, and uh, some internal changes is that, or d changes for developers, is that the asynchronous I.O. support is now paralyzed, so this is well, actually, it's, it's, it's quite relevant for users because if you're using QMU, it uses this support, uh, this, this API, and so this will perform faster. Uh, another interesting change is that the pseudo TTY uh, system, uh, there, this is not enabled by default, but there is a way of, um, of allocating TTYs on demand without requiring root privilege. Okay. Uh, some things that are relevant or interesting to developers, um, perhaps the main one is we've, we switched from the version 3.4 of the GCC, um, the compiler suite, to version 4.2.1. Um, this was necessary because this is the version that is um, now uh, their stable branch, and so this is the version that's been getting their development um, attention. Uh, so this is um, a good base to go forward with. Uh, very interesting for performance um, measurements is uh, we have a system called HWPMC, which is a uh, for using the performance counters that modern CPUs have been built. So this is a way of it's basically a profiling system, so you can see where your programs are, are spending their time. So either um, where they're executing instructions, or where you're having cache misses, or where you're having um, uh, register stalls, or whatever. Um, this this lets you measure this. And so this is a really excellent uh, performance tool for, for getting into the details of what your program is doing. This works both for user land and for the kernel. Uh, so uh, we've added support for simple versioning to several libraries, libc and, and uh, the thread libraries. Um, this is, um, um, well, uh, it's basically a way of maintaining compatibility um, to the future. There's a new malloc implementation which is much more scalable and this is um, much higher performance. We've uh, uh, done a lot of work in optimizing the locking primitives in the kernel. So SX locks are um, shared exclusive locks and RW locks are, well, it's the same, but don't allow one to sleep. Um, this, uh, these are now quite a bit optimized, so they perform much better. Uh, and, well, various other changes of interest to developers. So what, what, uh, what can we expect to, to see in the future? Of course, it's always hard to predict uh, what um, a bunch of de developers will decide to do. But there are some things that, that seem to be on the horizon. So FreeBSD 8.0 has been branched already. Um, this is part of the release process of FreeBSD 7. And we're expecting to deliver FreeBSD 8 sometime in 2009, um, maybe. Uh, that's the target. So what, what we're hoping to do is to, to continue to work on performance optimizations, and we've started now targeting 16 core systems, which are becoming increasingly available. 
Uh, there are ideas we have for improving uh, performance of, net, of the network stack and for the file systems that we hope to work on. Uh, an important thing that we need to work on is virtualization support, uh, in particular Zen, also VMware. Uh, and there's a work going on for network stack virtualization, so for example, each jail can have its own network stack, effectively. Um, there's a lot of recent interest in porting FreeBSD, or reporting FreeBSD, because it's done, been done before, to MIPS. Uh, this is the other um, uh, important embedded architecture, and a lot of companies actually are interested in, in, in getting uh, a, a viable MIPS port into, into CVS. Um, there's work being done on, a, on another uh, journaling file system for UFS called Bluffs, uh, which should make its appearance at some point. Uh, there's work being done on um, serial attached SCSI and, and serial ATA, um, importing, integrating this under CAM. So some improvements planned for the for SCSI and ATA support. And another project which is being being worked on is uh, is Dtrace, um, which is another uh, technology from Sun, which is a way of of, it's a really powerful um, debugging tool and analysis tool, which um, hopefully we will, um, we will soon get support for in, in, uh, in the system. And surely there'll be a lot of interesting stuff going on that we haven't thought of yet. Okay, so to summarize, um, I hope I've given you some evidence that FreeBSD 7 is uh, an interesting new release, um, and uh, we think it's, it's bringing FreeBSD back to the forefront of, of operating system performance on modern hardware. So this has been a long time in coming. Uh, we, uh, it's taken a lot of work to get to this, to this point, but um, it's good to be, to be back. Uh, FreeBSD 7 and uh, older versions have advanced features that aren't available in other, in other systems. So this is, there are very good reasons to use this, to choose FreeBSD uh, based on the features it provides. And uh, uh, we think it's an attractive platform for both high-end and also embedded hardware. So um, there's a lot of uh, work being done on both ends of the spectrum. And FreeBSD 7.0 will, will, is, is a, uh, a very good foundation for, um, for the next few years. So uh, where does one get this? Um, the best way is to download the, the latest beta. Um, if you go to, to this address, you can download the, uh, the latest beta. Actually, I think beta 2 is, 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 is on the release uh, this directory at the moment. Beta 3, uh, I, I believe, um, is, is being uh, uploaded this, this weekend. So um, if you check within a few days, the latest beta will be, be present there. So download the, the CD image, give it a try. Uh, if you find any problems or have any suggestions, we'd like to hear about them on the mailing list. Um, and uh, well, we hope you enjoy it. Uh, thank you very much. Yes? Uh, which subsystems still require Giant Fork? So the question is, which subsystems still require Giant? Um, so the main one is the TTY system requires Giant. So if you're doing um, I.O. to a terminal or to, to a serial port, um, that is acquiring Giant. Um, so that occasionally comes up, especially if you're doing a lot of print tests to, to, to the console, for example. Um, but it doesn't... Uh, so, so in a sense, the giant lock is, is now the TTY lock. Um, so it's, it doesn't uh, interfere with much other things. There are um, some file systems that, that are still require giant. So the most important one is probably MS-DOSFS. Um, is still giant locked. Um, and various other sort of smaller profile file systems require Giant. Um, some, let's see, some SCSI drivers. Um, and those, that's basically it, I think. There, there are a couple of places where there's like a couple of lines of code that, that require Giant, but they don't actually matter in, in, in real life. So, so that list is, is, is basically the, the complete list. Yes? Okay. Okay. So the question is about uh, tracking performance um, in some kind of tinderbox-like system where you can track performance over time. So I was talking to Brooks actually just a few minutes ago um, about about this, and there is work being done by, by, by a student, um, a master student, who, who's trying to, to work on on such a framework. So I, I, I'm very interested in this myself, and I hope that this will actually um, this will appear at some point. Yeah. Uh, 
Yes. OpenBSD performance. Uh, I didn't measure it myself um, uh, for the main reason that, that they haven't focused on performance um, until this point. Uh, they do have um, kind of FreeBSD 4 levels of, of support for multiple CPUs, but they also uh, have made design choices favoring security over performance at the expense of performance. So that there are kind of, uh, there haven't been theoretical reasons to, to, to look at it. Um, NetBSD did profile. OpenBSD performance compared to NetBSD and, and found basically it, it doesn't perform well on SMP. Um, so it's, it's somewhere on the level of Dragonfly, a bit, a bit higher than Dragonfly perhaps. Um, but really it's, you should not think of OpenBSD as a, as a um, if your goal is performance. Yes? So the question is uh, about improvements to the JAL subsystem. Um, I, I'm not sh so pa Pavel maybe can answer this question. <laughs> uh, are you aware of any, any major changes to jail? Okay, so the question is whether I've measured on Solaris. Uh, I haven't, and the reason is because uh, my uh, test system, I need to, to boot it over NFS. Um, it's, it, it's hard for me to install um, Solaris onto the... I, I don't have a spare disk in the machine to install onto the disk, so this means I, I'm actually net booting these, these, uh, these operating systems, and it's hard to bootstrap um, this in general, but also I don't know how to do it for Solaris. Um, so I would have to either get another disk into the machine and then do it that way or find out how to netboot it. Um, I would like to test on Solaris, uh, but I haven't yet been able to do that. 
Yes. Uh, are there the differences on your benchmarks between Opteron and Intel systems? Okay, so the uh, question is whether there's any uh, differences between Opteron and Intel. Um, so if I compare, so, so this, this, this graph is, um, is on an Intel system. It's actually an Intel system running in 32-bit mode. Um, firstly, the, the performance curve is the same as on the Opteron, this one. And the, the, if you look at the difference in, in the normalization, if you, if you scale this, this curve to lie on top of the other one, it's just, it's just accounted for by the CPU speed. There are no scalability, scalability issues of some, of some kind of that particular CPU? Not that I, not that I found in this benchmark. The, the only difference appears to be that, 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 um, that uh, the CPU speed is different and, and that this, the ratio of these accounts for the ratio of the graphs. Yes. Yeah, so, so this, these graphs, uh, the number of clients, this is each, so what this is, this uh, sysbench is a single process with some number of clients, each of them, with some number of threads, each client, each, th each thread is performing queries to the database. So this is the number of independent queries being made uh, by multiple threads. Okay, so we're out of time, but, but uh, please come up and ask me if you have further questions. I'd be happy to answer in person. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, pretty much